Mr. Reginald Peacock's Day by Catherine Mansfield. If there was one thing he hated more than another, it was the way she had of waking him in the morning. She did it on purpose, of course. It was her way of establishing her grievance for the day. And he was not going to let her know how successful it was. But really, really, to wake up a sensitive person like that was positively dangerous. It took him hours to get over it, simply hours. She came into the room, buttoned up in an overall with a handkerchief over her head, thereby proving that she had been up herself and slaving since dawn, and called in a low warning voice, Reginald, A, hey, what? What's that? What's the matter? It's time to get up. It's half past eight. And out she went. Um, this is volume. Shutting the door quietly after her to gloat over her triumph, she, he supposed. He rolled over in the big bed, his heart still beating in quick, dull throbs. And with every throb, he felt his energy escaping him. His, his inspiration for the day, stifling under those thudding blows, it seemed that she took a malicious delight in making life more difficult for him that heaven knows it was. By denying him his rights as an artist, by trying to drag him down to her level. What was the matter with her? What the hell did she want? Hadn't he three times as many pupils now as when they were first married? Earned three times as much, paid for every stick and stone that they possessed, and now had begun to shell out for Adrian's kindergarten? And had he ever reproached her? for not having a penny to her name. Never a word, never, never a sign. The truth was that once you married a woman, she became insatiable. And the truth was that nothing was more fatal for an artist than marriage. At any rate, until he was over 40, why had he married her? He asked himself this question, an average of three times a day. But he never could answer it satisfactory. She had caught him in a weak moment when the first plunge into reality had bewildered and overwhelmed him for a time. Looking back, he saw a pathetic, youthful creature, half-child, half-wild, untamed bird, totally incompetent to cope with bills and creditors and all the sordid details of existence. Well, she had done her best to clip his wings, if that was any satisfaction for her, and she could congratulate herself on the success of the early morning trick, she ought to wake exquisitely, reluctantly, he thought, slipping down into the warm bed. He began to imagine a series of enchanting scenes which ended with his latest, most charming pupil, putting her bare, scented arms around his neck and covering him with her long, perfumed hair. Awake, my love. And was his daily habit. While the bath water ran, Reginald Peacock tried his voice. When her mother tends her before the laughing mirror, looping up her laces, tying up her hair, he sang softly at first, listening to the quality, nursing his voice until he came to a third line. Often she thinks, were this wild thing wedded, and upon the word wedded he burst into such a shout of triumph that the tooth glass in the bathroom shelf trembled and even the bath tap seemed to gush stormy applause. Well, there was nothing wrong with his voice, he thought, leaping into the bath and soaping his soft pink body all over with a loofah shaped like a fish. He could fill Covent Garden with it, wetted, he shouted again, seizing the towel with a magnificent operatic gesture and went in singing while he rubbed as though he had been lagrin tipped out by an unwary swan and drying himself in the greatest haste before that tiresome Elsa came along, along. Back in the bedroom, he pulled the blind up with a jerk and standing up the pale square of sunlight that lay upon the carpet like a sheet of cream blotting paper, he began to do his exercises, deep breathing, bending forward and back, squatting like a frog and shooting out his legs 
For if there was one thing he had a horror of it was of getting fat, and men in his profession had a dreadful tendency that way. However, there was no sign of it at present. He was, he decided, just right, just in good proportion. In fact, he could not help a thrill of satisfaction when he saw himself in the glass, dressed in a morning coat, dark gray trousers, gray socks, and a black tie with a silver thread in it. Not that he was vain. He couldn't stand vain men. No, the sight of himself gave him a thrill of purely autistic satisfaction. Boy, locked out, he said, passing his hand over his sleek hair. That little, easy French phrase, blown so lightly from his lips, like a whiff of smoke, reminded him that someone had asked him again the evening before if he was English. People seemed to find it impossible to believe he hadn't some southern blood. True, there was an emotional quality in his singing that had nothing of the bull in it. The door handle rattled and turned round and round. Adrian's head popped through. Please, father. Mother says breakfast is quite ready. Please. Very well, said Reginald. Then, just as Adrian disappeared, Adrian? Yes, father. You haven't said good morning. A few months ago, Reginald had spent a week and in a very aristocratic family where the father received his little sons in the morning and shook hands with them. Reginald thought the practice charming and introduced it immediately, but Adrian felt dreadfully silly at having to shake hands with his own father every morning. Why did his father always sort of sing to him instead of talk? In excellent temper, temper Reginald walked into the dining room and sat down before a pile of letters, a copy of the Times, and a little covered dish. He glanced at the letters and then at his breakfast. There were two, slin, two thin slices of bacon and one egg. Don't you want any bacon, he asked. No, I prefer cold baked apple. I don't feel the need of bacon every morning. No. Now, did she mean that there was no need for him to have bacon every morning either? And that he grudged having to cook it for him? If you don't want to cook the breakfast, said he, why do you keep a servant? You know we can afford one, and you know how I loathe to see my wife doing the work, simply because all the women we have had in the past have been failures and utterly upset my regimen and made it almost impossible for me to have any pupils here. You've given up trying to find a decent woman. It's not impossible to train a servant, is it? I mean, it doesn't require genius, but I prefer to do the work myself. It makes life so much more peaceful. Run along, Adrian, darling, and get ready for school. Oh no, that's not it. Reginald pretended to smile. You do the work yourself because for some extraordinary reason you love to humiliate me. Objectively, you may not know that, but subjectively, it's the case. The last remark so delighted him that he cut open an envelope as gracefully as he had been on the stage. Dear Mr. Peacock, I feel I cannot go to sleep until I have thanked you again over the wonderful joy your singing gave me this evening. Quite unforgettable. You make me wonder as I have not wondered since I was a girl. If this is all, I mean, if this ordinary world is all, if there is not perhaps for those of us who understand divine beauty and richness awaiting us, as if only we have the courage to see it and to make it ours, the house is so quiet. I wish you were here now that I might thank you in person. You are doing a great thing. You are teaching the world to escape from life. Yours sincerely, Anon Fell. P.S. I am in every afternoon this week. The letter was scrawled on violet ink on thick handmade paper. Vanity, that bright bird, lifted its wings again, lifted them until he felt his breast would break. Oh well, don't let us quarrel, said he, and actually flung out a hand to his wife. But she was not great enough to respond. I must hurry and take Adrian to school, said he. Your room is quite ready for you. Very well, very well. Let there be open war between them. But he was hanged if he be the first to make it up again. He walked up and down his room, and he was not calm again until he heard the outer door close upon Adrian and his wife. Of course, if this went on, he would have to make some other arrangement. That was obvious. Tied and bound like this, he could. He, how could he help the world to escape from life? 
He opened the piano and looked up his pupils for the morning, Miss Betty Brittle, the Countess Wachowska, and Miss Marion Morrow. They were charming, all three. Punctually, at half past ten, the doorbell rang. He went to the door. Miss Betty Brittle was there, dressed in white, with her music in a blue silk case. I'm afraid I'm early, she said, blushing and shy, and she opened her big blue eyes very wide. Am I? Not at all, dear lady. I am only too charmed, said Reginald. Won't you come in? It's such a heavenly morning, said Miss Brittle. I walked across the park. The flowers were too marvelous. Well, think about them while you sing your exercises, said Reginald. Sitting down at the piano, it will give your voice color and warmth. Oh, what an enchanting idea. What a genius Mr. Peacock was. She parted her pretty lips and began to sing like a pansy. Very good, very good indeed, said Reginald, playing chords that would waft a hardened criminal to heaven. Make the notes round. Don't be afraid. Linger over them. Breathe them like a perfume. How pretty she looked, standing there in her white frock, her little blonde head tilted, showing her milky throat. Do you ever practice before a glass? Said, asked Reginald. You ought to, you know. It makes the lips more flexible. Come over here. They went over to the mirror, stood side by side. Now sing mu iku i u i a. She broke down and blushed more brightly than ever. Oh, she cried, I can't. It makes me feel so silly. It makes me want to laugh. I do look so absurd. No, you don't. Don't be afraid, said Reginald, but laugh too. Very kindly. Now try again. The lesson simply flew, and Betty Brittle quite got over her shyness. When can I come again? She asked, tying the music up again to the blue silk case. I want to take as many lessons as I can just now. Oh, Mr. Peacock, I do enjoy them so much. May I come the day after tomorrow? Dear lady, I shall be only so ch too charmed said Reginald, bowing her out. Glorious girl, and when they had stood in front of the mirror, her white sleeve had just touched his black one. He could feel, yes, he could actually feel the warm, glowing spot, and he stroked it. She loved her lessons. His wife came in. Reginald, can you let me have some money? I must pay the dairy. And will you be in for dinner tonight? Yes, you know I'm singing at Lord Timbuk's at half past nine. Can you make me some clear soup with an egg in it? Yes, and the money, Reginald? It's eight and sixpence. Surely that's very heavy, isn't it? No, it's just what it ought to be, and Adrian must have milk. She was... There she was off again. Now she was standing up for Adrian against. I have not the slightest desire to deny my child a proper amount of milk, said he. Here is ten shillings. The doorbell rang. He went to the door. Oh, said Countess Wilkowska, the stairs. I have not a breath. And she put her hand over her heart, and she followed him to the music room. She was all in black, with a little black hat, and floating veil, violets in her bosom. Do not make me sing exercises today, she cried, throwing out her hands in a delightful fo foreign way. Oh, not today. I want to sing songs, and make, and may I take off my violets? They may fade soon. They fade so soon, they fade so soon, played Reginald on the piano. May I put them there? Asked the Countess, dropping them to a little vase that stood in front of one of Reginald's photographs. Dear lady, I should only be too charmed. She began to sing, and all was well until she came to the phrase, You love me? Yes, I know you love me. Down dropped her hands from the keyboard. He wheeled round, facing her. No, no, that's not good enough. You can do better than that, cried Reginald ardently. You must sing as if you were in love. Listen, let me, sh let me try and show you. And he sang. Oh, yes, yes, I see what you mean, stammered the Countess. May I try it again? Certainly. Do not be afraid. Let yourself go. Confess yourself. Make proud surrender. He called above the music, and she sang. Yes, better that time, but I feel you are capable of more. Try it with me. There must be a kind of exultant defiance as well. Don't you feel? And they sang together. Ah, 
Now she was sure she understood. May I try once again? You love me. Yes, I know you love me. The lesson was over before that phrase was quite perfect. The little foreign hands trembled as they put the music together. And you are forgetting your violets, said Reginald softly. Yes, I think I will forget them, said the Countess, biting her under lip. What fascinating ways these foreign women have. And you will come to my house on Sunday and make music, she asked. Dear lady, I shall only be too charmed, said Reginald. Weep ye no more, sad fountains. Why need ye flow so fast, sang Miss Marian Morrow. But her eyes filled with tears and her chin trembled. Don't sing just now, said Reginald. Let me play it for you. He played so softly. Is there anything the matter? asked Reginald. You're not quite happy this morning. No, she wasn't. She was awfully miserable. You don't care to tell me what it is? It really was nothing particular. She was, she had one of those moods sometimes, when life seemed almost unbearable. Ah, I know, he said, if I could only help. You do know, you do. Oh, but if I were, not for my lessons, I don't feel I could go on. Sit down in the armchair and smell the violets and let me sing to you. I will do you, it will do you just as much good as a lesson. Why weren't all men like Mr. Peacock? I wrote a poem after the concert last night, just about what I felt. Of course, it wasn't personal. May I send it to you? Dear lady, I should only be too charmed. By the end of the afternoon, he was quite tired, and lay down on a sofa to rest his voice before dressing. The door of his room was open. He could hear Adrian and his wife talking in the dining room. Do you know what that teapot reminds me of, Mummy? It reminds me of a little... Sitting down, kitten. Does it, Mr. Absurdity? Reginald dozed. The telephone bell woke him. Unknown fell was speaking, Mr. Peacock. And I have heard that you are singing Lord Timbuks tonight. Will you dine with me? And we can go together afterwards. And the words of his reply dropped like flowers down the telephone. Dear lady, I should be only too charmed. What a triumphant evening. The little dinner teat a teat with iron fell the drive to lord timbuks in her white motor car when he thanked him when she thanked him for the unforgettable joy triumph upon triumph and lord timbuks champagne simply flowed have some more champagne peacock said lord timbuk peacock you notice not mr peacock but peacock as if there were one of them wasn't he and wasn't he? He was an artist. He could sway them all. And wasn't he teaching them all to escape from life? How he, how he sang, and he, as he sang, as in a dream, he saw their feathers and their flowers and their fans and offered them, lay before him like a huge bouquet. Have another glass of wine, Peacock. I could have done, I could have any one I liked by lifting a finger, thought Peacock, positively staggering home. But as he let himself into the dark flat, his marvelous sense of elation began to ebb away. He turned up the light in the bedroom. His wife lay asleep, squeezed over to her side of the bed. He remembered suddenly how she had, how, he remembered suddenly how she had said when he had told her he was going out to dinner. You might have let me know before, and how he had answered. Can't you possibly speak to me without offending against even good manners? It was incredible, he thought, that she cared so little for him. Incredible that she wasn't interested in the slightest in his triumphs and his artistic career. When so many women in her place would have given their eyes, yes, he knew it. Why not acknowledge it? And there she lay, an enemy even in her sleep. Must it ever be thus? He thought, the champagne still working. Ah, if we only were friends, how much could I tell her now about this evening? Even about Tim Buck's manner to me and all that they said to me and so on and so on. If only I felt that she was here to come back to, that I could confide in her and so on and so on. In his emotion, he pulled off 
his evening boot and simply hurried it to, in the corner. The noise woke his wife with a terrible start. She sat up, pushing back her hair, and he suddenly decided to have one more try to treat her as a friend, to tell her everything, to win her. Down he sat on the side of the bed and seized one of her hands. But of all these splendid things he had to say, not one could he utter. For some fiendish reason, the only words he could get out were, Dear lady, I should be so charmed, so charmed. And that's the end of Mr. Reginald Peacock's day. Mr. Reginald Peacock, what is it called? Mr. Reginald Peacock's day. I guess he was having a good day, but you know, he seems to have an enjoyable job where he teaches people how to play the piano and sing. And, you know, goes to a party after work and goes home to his wife. He seems like he has an enjoyable life. Sometimes people aren't really satisfied with what they have and they think, there's always something better around the corner and some people are never satisfied with anything that they think there's always something better. Let me know in the comments below what do you think of the story. I personally like the story. Um, you know, story about life, someone with, with a happy job, a happy life. Um, please subscribe to this channel to be part of the community and please like this video. It really helps the channel out a lot. Thank you for watching. Have a great day. Bye-bye.